We don't know how many people in Great Britain are homosexuals, although the popular estimate is one in every 20 persons, and we don't know for sure if our national average is higher than that of other countries. It's true the French like to call sodomy the vis anglais, but in the absence of reliable statistics, we can always dismiss that as anglophobia. Uh, one thing is certain, public attitudes to homosexuality in this country have changed and are changing. It's still a crime in Britain for male homosexuals to make love, but with a reform bill waiting to be given a third reading in the House of Commons, prosecutions now are rare. The law does not cover female homosexuals. The existing act was passed by a Victorian parliament, which seems to have found it impossible to legislate for the unmentionable. Homosexuality, male and female, in Britain today was the subject of a Man Alive inquiry on BBC Two. The program called Consenting Adults was in two parts. The first, shown last week, was about men. The second, shown earlier tonight, was about the women. The program made no judgments and passed no opinions. It let homosexuals speak for themselves about their common condition. This is an excerpt from part one, The Men. Did you fall in love with each other? That's, um, well, there's not a straight yes or no. I. I thought I did. I think I can speak for you. No, you didn't fall in love with me, did you? No. I thought I did with him, but I'm not sure now whether it wasn't just that he was the first person like myself that I'd met, and it was just that it was someone that I could talk to, and someone it relieved my feelings to, for the first time. And perhaps I, I mixed that up with what I thought was love. I don't know. I, but at the time, I thought, and for oh, perhaps many, many years, I thought I was in love. But you say you didn't fall in love at all. You didn't even think you were in love. With my friend here? Mm. No. No. Do you have any regrets about the last 25 years? Well, no. Uh, I wish I had been born now because a public opinion is different and I would have read more and I would have known more and I wouldn't have started out quite so backward and frightened, shy, not knowing anything when I started out. Life when before you meet someone is hell. It's you just you never met anyone else. It it is really hell for a person. Uh, and you get that you, you feel you want to jump off a bridge. You don't know what to do. You walk the streets and you you, you don't know a single person to talk to. You, nowadays, I imagine you could find, find out information somewhere or other, but you couldn't then, before the war. It, it was all hush-hush. So I wish I'd been born a few years later. And my teenage, my, my teen years have been wouldn't have been quite so difficult. Watching that program and its sequel were Maureen Duffy, poet, playwright and novelist whose most recent novel, The Microcosm, is about lesbians living in London. A doctor in general practice who's made a particular study of homosexual problems. Michael Schofield, the social psychologist, who, among other books, is the author of socio sociological aspects of homosexuality, and Ray Morby, a Conservative MP who's against the Homosexual Law Reform Bill in its present form. If I could roll the ball off to a start with you, Maureen Duffy, watching those two programs, because you saw a recording of the first one uh, tonight, as well as the one that went out live, do you think this kind of program, the way it was presented, has achieved anything to solve what is a very real social problem? Well, I think any kind of discussion, any presentation of real live people in situations must do some good, however minimal, um, in the same way that uh, presenting it in the form of a novel, I think, must do some good mm -hmm. as well. 
It was through deliberate choice the program, both of them about consenting adults, made no attempt to introduce professional opinions, either psychiatric or otherwise. They just let homosexuals speak for themselves. No, and this seems to me a, you know, a far better thing to do. After all, you can assemble your experts afterwards and mm. let them chew it over. Indeed, and in front of them <laughs> is on my left, Michael Schofield. Yes, I thought it was quite a good program. In a way, slightly unambitious. It was a series of case histories, really. Mm. So it didn't point out what were the important issues. If an issue came up during the case, then it was mentioned. If it didn't, well, it wasn't emphasised. I was pleased that we didn't have the usual um, high back chair with the anonymous voice. I think mm. that somebody was speaking into the camera was good. But in another way, that means perhaps that they're not quite typical. I don't think many people will speak into a camera in that way. But um, apart from that, I think, um, although it wasn't, um, as you say, bringing out the uh, professional point of view, it, it's good that the homosexual has a chance to speak, I think. Doctor? Well, I entirely agree with Mr. Schofield that it was a good idea to have a chance to speak, but I did feel both programmes uh, were terribly unrepresentative of perhaps the majority of homosexuals of both sexes. The second program that we saw this evening, I thought, had uh, far more, made far more impact, and I'm very interested in the impression it made on one of the people watching downstairs. Who this is the one on lesbians. Before. Yes, yeah. who really seem quite horrified, and that so many people should be in such distress. On the question of how representative it was, the, uh, the producer was left with the choice of, of giving us a a lot of people in a very quick time, or of developing, letting the personalities of a few people be mm. developed. This is an obvious difficulty, but I do think that perhaps it is, uh, we ought to get round to realising that programmes of this kind have got to be longer. This is, after all, we went out on BBC Two. It would surely perhaps be better to have a programme like this every fortnight and give it an hour, mm. rather than uh, try and in cope with these enormous problems in half an hour. It just can't be done. Ray Morby, your reaction to both programmes, gentlemen. Well, it looks as if I'm the odd man out, because first of all, I don't honestly think this is the type of programme that should go out at eight o'clock in the evening, um, when at this time of the year there are many children who are still um, up, and uh, I don't really think that um, this is the type of programme that ought to go out at that time. The fact that we're now discussing this matter at half past eleven, um, uh, of course, is a different matter, but uh, that's my own view. Uh, going out at eight o'clock in the evening, surely the only people who could be affected would be too young to appreciate the, the deep significance and those who are old enough say who've reached the age of puberty probably need to know these things wouldn't you concede i don't think so hmm. i don't think so I, I think that this is um uh, this is a uh, dealing with a twilight area of abnormal people and um, and it's something that i oh. don't think is out for, for public discussion <laughs> but uh, if uh, we accept at least for the moment the statistics of one in twenty um, all the children are going to be in contact with people who have these problems, uh, even for their own protection. Uh, they must know about these things. Well, I don't the younger ones, I don't feel, I quite agree, I can't see that what you don't understand, you're too young to understand, you just don't absorb, and those that are old enough to have some understanding, it's absolutely vital that they know. I, I can think of endless case histories, especially of young boys. People are keen enough on warning girls, but people don't warn boys about uh, normal boys, not homosexual mm. boys, about the risks that they come across. And uh, I have known uh, quite a number of lads who have come across quite a number of unpleasant situations simply because they hadn't got a clue what they were up again. And nobody, everybody's always telling little girls they mustn't speak to strange men, but nobody explains the danger why a boy shouldn't. Mm. But I don't think this is quite the way that a boy ought to learn. Uh, can I just interrupt at this point, because I had intended to introduce an example from the second programme in the series, which went out tonight, in fact. I forgot to do so. I'll correct that omission now, and then we'll go on with the discussion. Uh, as I said, we'll continue to talk about the Man Alive programme and the wider field of homosexual problems. But right now, here's an example from part two of Consenting Adults, seen earlier tonight and called The Women. I've got to think it out there. Yes. It was over the page. Are you in love with her? Yes, of course. How long have you known her for? Three months. Is it a good relationship that might last? 
I thought it was, but what I've told you before is true of this relationship too. We discussed it all, we were very truthful with each other, very honest. We thought we could make something of this. We both believe in absolute love. And then, you know, one feels one is there, one has arrived. Paradise is just around the corner. You think you've got the key to unlock the door. But then suddenly she realized that I had a family, which she knew, of course, beforehand. I mean, she knew this as a fact. But the implications were suddenly revealed to her. Should she break up my family now at this stage? Or should she not? No, she doesn't want to do that. And even if she does, will I want to go back to my family later on? So suddenly I found myself again with empty hands, wondering why in hell I was ever born. And there isn't anything I can do. I can only look forward to another 20 years of life, perhaps 25, if I'm unlucky enough to live as long as that. Never finding what I want. I'm living with a man who has no hope of ever being able to establish a kind of relationship that he wants with me. Nothing, in fact. Nothing but the wilderness without love. That woman, married, is a lesbian, and she kept her face averted for the sake of her children. Maureen Duffy, her problem was, uh, I suppose, not a very common one among homosexuals generally, but... Uh, a very serious and profound one. Uh, I think it is quite a common mm. one because this introduces something that I think the programme left out, which is the, the whole vast area of bisexuality. I would say that most people have at least one sexual, one homosexual impulse in the course mm. of their lives, and many, many lead completely double lives. There are thousands of married men mm. who have a night on the town with the boys mm. from time to time when they can't stand it any longer. Uh, the question of bisexuality is something I'd like to take up in a moment, but uh, this woman was, in fact, an avowed lesbian who married for, for social reasons rather than emotional ones. Yes, we did uh, see that. <laughs> she, she, she said um, that she would tell her children yes. later on, which was a brave decision, if mm. a wrong one. Do you think it was wrong, in fact? Uh, no, I don't think so, because um, it's like the business of telling your children that they're adopted if they are. Uh, it's much better that they should be told by you than that they should find out by having the children calling names after them at school. And I, I know of cases where this has happened, um, where the children have been told, oh, your mother's a lesbian, and it would have been so much better if mum had told them in the first place. Michael Skiffin. In fact, there were two cases in that programme in which uh, the women said that people openly laughed and sneered at them. I wouldn't have thought this was all that common, but... It These were fairly overt. Because they weren't there. Well, this last mm. one, too. Um, mm. She said this, I believe. This married woman mm. said that people laughed at her. Well, if this is the case, then obviously it's much better that, that the children should find out from her um, than they should find out from other people. It's a pretty shattering thought, isn't it, that, um, that uh, lesbians um, get this kind of treatment? Oh, indeed it is. I don't know that it's as common as all that. Um, after all, the majority of lesbians been to manage to get by um, without anybody but a very few people knowing of their emotional needs. This doesn't make for very satisfactory or full life, but it does avoid them being subjected to social ostracism. Yes, yes I'm sure that's right. I, it, it's also a point which wasn't made in the film, but I think is pretty clear, in, in that indeed most lesbians don't live in a big city. Most lesbians live in a village or, or a country town. And the fact that two women are living together doesn't arise, arouse the same suspicions as when two men are living together. In fact, it's considered uh, rather more decent, perhaps, than for a woman to live on her own in our society. Mm. Yes, that raises the whole question of, of the one obvious anomaly in, in the present law governing homosexual uh, behaviour. Uh, Ray Morby, uh, you, you're opposed to the present homosexual law reform bill. Mm. Uh, how opposed? Oh, uh, I'm, I, I should say that I'm mainly opposed to the bill, and the main reason that I am opposed to it, in case anyone may think there's any illogicality in my view, early in the picture with the women, 
uh, it was stated that even the fact that they had a, a different legal status didn't really make any difference to the way they were treated by society. Uh, and, um, and so therefore I believe that um, this, is the, um, uh, this is the case that um, the, um, the lesbian... Women aren't blackmailed, though, are they? Oh, well, there's no to make any difference. <laughs> I just don't agree with the programme on this. I mean, this is, this is uh, just a statement on the programme which I would fundamentally disagree with. Of course they still have enormous problems by society's rejection, but this is nothing like the problem that the males have. And it's also true, of course, that, that when the law is changed, and I say when rather than if, but the male homosexuals will still have a lot of problems, oh. perhaps even some new ones. Um, but this isn't in itself a reason for, for not changing the law. Well, I, I see it. You see, one of the main arguments that is always put forward is that the, uh, under the peasant situation, that the, um, that the male homosexual I is um, liable to blackmail. Now, I believe that the man is more afraid, not of the law, but of the social ostracism that he will suffer um, if, in fact, he doesn't pay the blackmail. And so, therefore, I believe that even a change in the law would not alter the basic danger of blackmail, and it would certainly uh, make a tremendous difference uh, to the uh, security position um, uh, as far as many people in this country are concerned. You will remember that the bill, in fact, leaves out all the armed forces. There's now a new amendment been added to leave out all those in the merchant navy. Now, if it is right and proper for discipline or for security, for a section to be left out, uh, then indeed one ought to bring in uh, all the people who are, um, who are sworn to the Official Secrets Act, for instance. Uh, and once one does this, you can see that you can spread it But the whole wide. point of the law is just to stop homosexuals being a security les risk. Nobody considers lesbians a security risk, whatever else they consider them. Um, a, a, a homosexual is surely only a security risk because he is so much more vulnerable than the next one. Or would you consider that the homosexual state makes him much more liable to tell secrets to his boyfriend than somebody would to their mistress? No, he is more liable to blackmail, as we've seen in many of the security cases in the past, where most of them involved, I'm not uh, going too far, but most of the people involved in security cases um, have been found to be male homosexuals. Of course they are. And they were not blackmailed. I believe that the main thing was not because of the danger of their being brought into a police court, but the danger that their friends and relatives and parents uh, would in fact be told by the blackmailer if they refused uh, oh, to okay. either pay the money or hand over whatever they were asked for. Yes, well then how do you account for the fact that um, since it seemed likely that the bill will go through uh, many male homosexuals have said to me that for the first time they have declared themselves to their friends, workmates, parents, and they felt a tremendous liberation of spirit because of this feeling that at last they are not criminals when they're in bed. I think blackmail is only one of the reasons, mm -hmm. but yes. at, at any rate, let's get it clear, I'm sure it's not true that that most security cases deal with um, male homosexuals. I mean, a heterosexual can just as easily um, be blackmailed. And indeed, you that might is. well make the case that anybody with a sexual problem uh, shouldn't perhaps um, mm. be in security. But in fact, of course, you often can't find out if they have a sexual mm. problem or not. Mm. Uh, they I may I not know themselves. Sorry. They may not even know themselves. Mm. I just want to clear, uh, Mr. Moore, do you think homosexuals should be sent to prison? Yes. Oh, yes, if they are, um, if they are... Surrounded by other men or other women. Oh, as uh, what's it uh, going, what useful purpose is going to be served by sending them to prison? The fact that this is a deterrent uh, against the practices. You see, if, if one could rely upon male homosexuals, I just make this point, practicing among themselves and not interfering with society, this might be a different matter. But as far as I can make out, the majority of male homosexuals are proselytizers. In other words, like the man who comes to London, are trying to bring more people into the fold. This poor and, um, chap was trying to find another homosexual. He made that <laughs> amply clear, and how you know how frightfully difficult he found it. Uh, clearly, they're not. Go most homosexuals are not going to go around uh, exposing themselves to the rebukes they would receive from a heterosexual. 
Besides, I mean, surely this whole business of proselytising is, is nonsense, except insofar as the very young are concerned. Who must, of course, be protected, but yes, this law goes quite. for both. Yes, yes. Yes, I think this is quite true. In fact, uh, every research, that serious research has been done on it, shows that homosexuals are looking for other homosexuals. Now, if they wish to um, convert other people, then it's unlikely that they're, 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 they're liable to get into trouble from the other person. But anyway, why do you want to go to so much trouble to defend heterosexuals? I mean, you talk as if there's going to be a floodgate uh, as soon as the law is changed of heterosexuals <laughs> wanting to become homosexual. Well, that seems to put normal sexual intercourse on rather a low plane. No, no, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to make that point at all. But, uh, and, and uh, I, I don't in fact see any um, any heterosexuals uh, deliberately going out of their way uh, because I think they, they have a, a, a healthy regard um, for normal practices and they wouldn't go, go in for abnormal practices just because the law was changed. All I'm saying is that it would, I believe, quite sincerely, it would be a greater menace, particularly to younger people, um, if indeed one took away uh, a law which has been there for so long. Well, does in that case the law that protects the young of both sexes need strengthening? Because uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, if the law as it stands doesn't make any difference uh, to the protection of the young, if what you say is true, then it seems to me that the law that protects our young people of either sex is quite inadequate. It should Basically. be extended to, in that case, I mean, logically, to cover female homosexuals as well. Yes, well, so uh, certainly. I think it probably should. You know, and I would, and I, I think this should have nothing to do with which sex it is. The corruption of the young. Corruption of the young is corruption of the, the young. young. I mean, oh, whether yes. it's heterosexual, homosexual. Well, I would agree completely. And I would, um, uh, and I would support any measures to give greater protection uh, to the young. This is, um, this is one of the things that I, that I believe in. But I think rather the reverse, that the present law is likely to, um, as far as it goes, to protect the young to some extent, in that um, with a, a greater possibility of finding other like-minded males, there will be less temptation for those who do uh, fancy younger boys to do so. The thing that really worries me is the fact that uh, uh, if it goes through in the, in the form in which it exists at the moment, uh, two little nine-year-old boys um, playing in the lavatories have suddenly become criminals. And this is, of course, very worrying. I mean, because th the age is so high about 21, the age of consent, um, that mm, there are going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of schoolboys. Uh, yes, but on the other hand, no one has yet taken action against uh, all the little boys who do play in lavatories in schools and elsewhere no, up not to date. Yet, so but I mean, the, the, do you think they'll start doing stronger? so now? This is, this is in fact stronger than it's ever been, surely. I think anyway, the corruption of, of the young is, is a bit exaggerated. Mm. In fact, the, the research I carried out for the Home Office showed quite clearly that the homosexual who is attracted to another adult, another adult man, is only very, very rarely uh, attracted to a, a young child. It's a different phenomenon, the child the molesters. It's a um, quite different phenomenon. After all, this is comparable to the schoolmaster who fancies little six-year-old girls. I mean, yes. a heterosexual schoolmaster. Yes. You don't usually consider the average man to be uh, who has an active sex mm. life to be a menace to little girls. Mm. Mm. This, this is a whole uh, interesting new point you've raised, though. The, uh, Mr. Morby earlier mentioned uh, the question of security risks. So homosexuals of either sex in a position of trust, if you like, as teachers or as ministers of the church, are, if you like, in a rather dangerous or delicate position at least. Uh, do you think they should be, they should be screened in, for these positions, positions of trust, if you like? No, but I think anyone in positions of trust um, must be, should have perhaps more screening than is now common in that they are emotionally fitting for the fitted for the job because I think one must remember that perhaps a higher percentage of homosexuals are immature than of heterosexuals because it is frequently um, simply a secondary phenomena in people who are otherwise disturbed although there are plenty of homosexuals who are not otherwise disturbed but frequently it is uh, found in this and therefore uh, we ought in any case to be far careful, not because, particularly in this conjunction, we're much more careful about who we put in charge of our young. Mm. But it, it seems to me, you know, that do, in a sense we've all sort of 
uh, assumed automatically that it necessarily is corruption, that it necessarily is wrong, that in fact we are accepting um, the tribal beliefs of a very small desert tribe which needed to reproduce fantastically in 1967 when we, we certainly don't need to reproduce, I mean we are now going to the moon, um, one would expect that our moral thinking would be following along at least somewhere behind, not two or three thousand years. If we would consider that uh, a, a schoolmaster who um, made sexual advances to his... To small children. Small children yes, of small either children. sex, I mean mm. of, of little girls also to be corrupting, obviously to introduce a sexual mm. element into a position of trust is wrong. And this yes, but there has been a tendency to mm. equate homosexual with corrupt. I quite agree, this is quite is wrong. Quite no, wrong. I don't I think mean, it's it, right it is a phenomenon. Yes, I, I, I wouldn't take this on its own. The way I see it, that we are in danger, I believe, and this is not just the one subject that we're dealing with, but with many other subjects, we are in danger of permanently damaging our social fabric. The thing is, we are in what I call a permissive society. If you take the number of bills going through the House of Commons that are seeking to do this, that and the other, the next one, if these go through, will be to allow euthanasia, and gradually, um, we shall, I believe, uh, do what other empires have done in the past, uh, destroy themselves because they are not prepared uh, to at least maintain the basic part of social fabric. And I, I think, think this, this is, is a one part. fallacy, if you I don't mind my saying so. I think it's an absolute historic fallacy. I can't honestly believe any empire has destroyed itself by this kind of corruption. It's destroyed itself by power corruption, maybe, but I, not by sexual corruption. And by it. ignoring the laws, <laughs> when the law becomes too much out of tune with, pub, uh, with normal uh, social practice, uh, and th law, the law no longer counts, this is surely where a society disintegrates. Yes, and quite honestly, yes, our social is fabric, uh, what is so splendid about it that it couldn't do with a radical overhaul? I mean, has it done so well? We are in a permissive society, you're quite right, and indeed, and it's, it's quite too. permissive. There are thousands of heterosexual affairs too. Do you want to legalise, uh, to make them illegal in some way? Or do you want to make adultery illegal? It can't really be done by the law. It's especially as, if you think of it, that... Uh, Adultery is probably more socially destructive as far as the next generation is concerned than a homosexual affair. I wouldn't go as far as that. I'd say it is, it is destructive. I, I don't know whether well, it, whether I mean it is Well, I mean, a homosexual affair is unlikely to affect the next generation, provided the adults concerned are neither of them youngsters, while adultery frequently after mm. all is up. It's quite a good point. To take a mm. promiscuous heterosexual and compare him to a promiscuous homosexual, the promiscuous het heterosexual is risking a, a marriage and a family, whereas a promiscuous homosexual is only damaging perhaps himself, perhaps one other person. It's, n it's not children one and a family. No. Mm. Can I move uh, to the root causes of homosexuality, uh, about which no one seems to be agreed? Can I ask you, first of all, Doctor, uh, whether you think uh, that uh, the environmental factor is not, not only dominant, but uh, the, the exclusive reason for homosexual yes, deviation? Yes, I think it probably is, but I think the damage starts very early. How early? I, from earliest infancy, but I don't think it is a genetic factor. This, of course, not been proved yet either way. Uh, you, you, you said damage again. Uh, Maureen Duffy earlier raised mm -hmm. the point. Is it necessarily damaging in a... In a society well, that doesn't yes, need to I leave. think so. I think our society should be able to accept all different forms of behaviour because I think a great many heterosexual uh, sexual practices and sexual emotional expression could do is, is, is clearly uh, lacks fulfilment in many ways. But I think homosexuality is one manifestation of a failure to fully develop sexually. Mm. But uh, I think they share this 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 failure to fully develop is shared. True of all homosexuals. Perhaps not of all, but in a great many cases. I wonder about this. You know, there's a sort of tendency when we're being very liberal to say that homosexuality shouldn't be a crime, but it is a sickness, an illness. Well, if it is a sickness, it's just about the biggest illness in the country. Yes, that's I mean, perfectly it's true. Mm -hmm. perhaps one and a half million people who are homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Well, this therefore is a greater health problem than cancer. No, or I don't or think it's really a sickness. Um, not unless we're going to consider a great many more people, uh, hetero and homosexual, sick. I think perhaps it is a failure to reach the fullest potential of development in that particular sphere. Obviously, they may develop I far greater ways in other spheres. 
But I don't think that quite most people are capable, um, I mean, certainly physiologically, we are capable of all forms of sexual experience. Um, you know, I would, it seems to me there is often an element of choice in this, which has not perhaps come to light yet in investigation. I don't think it's a, a matter for genetics. I think it's often a matter of adjusting to our own particular social fabric and social needs. For some people, but for a great many people, they, they have no choice in that they are quite unable to form a satisfactory relationship with a member of the opposite sex. Uh, but do we know uh, that they haven't already made a choice and that this is why they are unable to? Well, in that case, they've sometimes made the choice very young indeed. Oh, yes, yes. Why not? Well, uh, does one call <laughs> this a choice? Uh, this is perhaps playing with the word choice. I don't think there's much choice in it. No, I think, I indeed, either. the discussion about uh, causes is, is a bit irrelevant at present. It's multi-causal, mm -hmm. obviously uh, no one cause is, is going to explain it. Um, people worry whether it's inborn or whether mm. environment. If it is environment, it's so early on that it doesn't really make much mm. difference. I mean, if it's going to happen in the first five years, then it isn't much mm. difference between whether it's born or whether it's But are we perhaps not forgetting that there are uh, an awful lot of uh, people who are not so clearly hetero or homosexual, but there's a whole spectrum of sexuality, yes, from the right. extreme mm. heterosexual to the extreme homosexual, mm. and there's a tremendous movement in between. There are a number of people, in fact, I would say perhaps many more than we realise, people who spend part of their life being homosexuals who become heterosexual. Not through any dramatic methods like uh, aversion therapy, but uh, whose mm. needs change and whose people they meet Satisfy is, any yes. change. is there such a thing, do you think, or have you encountered one in your experience as the complete bisexual, an indiscriminate bisexual, who has no emotional bias towards either sex? No, side? not completely, but I have met a number who seem fairly indiscriminate, although uh, tending to one or the other, tending always to take uh, one as a, a substitute for the other not being readily available on that mm. opportunity. You were talking about the permissive society early on. Isn't it? We're certainly a long way from uh, complete social acceptance of homosexuality in, in all its forms, or indeed in any of its forms. But uh, is there a danger of it becoming glamorized simply because it, it belongs to a minority? There's a tendency for a certain type of homosexual today to see his antecedents as Michelangelo and, and Socrates for this particular kind of homosexual. To think of himself as the I member of a I think this is true, and I think the change in the law would help gifted. this a lot. There's mm. a certain type, and, and the young, young, young boys who think it would be slightly dangerous. So if we change the law, that alone would... Uh, and I do think that it danger. induces a, a tremendous amount of, you know, and I would use the word unhealthy here, unhealthy self-pity among homosexuals themselves. Yes, I, I wouldn't put too much on the glamorised side. The, the boy gets a pretty rough time from his mates, you know, mm. who decides he's, he's going to be open. You think it's a kind of overcompensation, I think? Uh, well, I would have thought so, mm. yes, many times. After all, think, think what, it, what happens to, to the person having his first homosexual experience. He's got to, it's nearly always with a stranger, this we found in researches, because he simply dare not approach one of his friends. Because if he was wrong, and he approached the wrong person, then he's out of the group, and, and it, from then on he's not allowed in with the same group. Mm. Mr. Morby, has it ever troubled you, uh, the historical evidence that some of our greatest geniuses have been homosexual? that Michelangelo, Socrates, to name two, might well be in prison today. This, this is one of those, uh, this is one of those things that, um, that they, it has been said earlier, and I don't accept the argument, that there are one in twenty who are homosexual. Mm. Uh, now, there were a lot of artists in those days, uh, and um, so obviously you would find that some were homosexual. Uh, so it, it, we are obviously told of the ones that were. Uh, and they may well have been one in a hundred, one in two hundred, or one in a thousand, which I think is nearer the figure that they are in this country at the present moment. Real. Do you really think so? Yes, I really think so. If and until evidence, <laughs> even, even Absey, the promoter of the bill, says no one knows. 
and this is purely Agreed, a guess. But that's simply because uh, this our, is purely our, a guess, our, our, our and the only the only estimate that can be made is by saying they have got some reliable figures in America, uh, and we bear some uh, our society well, bears some relation mm -hmm. to America. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? If, if it really is one in twenty, and there are what six hundred and fifty MPs, then that. That means 26 of our MPs are homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> They're truly representative of our. <laughs> if this, if this is, if this is true, uh, uh, that is so. Uh, all that I would say is that I have no evidence to suggest that there is anything like that number. It would but be if they're very unwise if you're an MP to uh, stand up and be counted in this respect, wouldn't it? Before we start looking yes. for evidence yes. in the House of Commons or elsewhere, <laughs> I must bring you now to, to a, f a final point. And it springs from one of the programmes we saw earlier this evening. I th yes, it was the one we saw tonight, in fact, about lesbians. I think one of the women interviewed said, it is time, she feels, that homosexuals came out of the shadows in this more permissive and, quote, enlightened age and announced what they were and why they were what they are. Do you think it is time, Maureen Duffy? Uh, it's always time, but obviously you have to be a very brave person in order to do it. Somebody wrote to me after reading the microcosm and said, uh, thank you very much for writing the book. It has made me so much braver and uh, I am telling all my friends, etc. And I hastily wrote back and said, do be careful. Um, because Yes, obviously, um, it's like all these social problems. Somebody has to be the first to stand up and say, look, I am this. But you must be a very strong person to do this. Mm. Do Michael Scofield. Yeah. Did you notice in the male one, the one a week ago, um, all the people who were faced with the camera were self-employed. Um, the only one who, who was um, with the back was the only one who, was, who had to face his employer the next day. I would hesitate to advise a homosexual to come out in the open yet. I wouldn't dream of it. Mm. I mean, mm. if they've got the ability to, I mean, the necessary stamina to stand against it, they'll have already done it. Mm. A last word, Ray Morby. Uh, al allowing for the fact that since there don't seem to be, doesn't seem to be enough evidence uh, to your liking about the practice of homosexuality, do you think it would clear the air a little if at least some of them volunteered the knowledge? Uh, well, of course, it, it, it would be helpful, but naturally I wouldn't expect any male homosexual to mm. tell anyone, because um, he, he could be caught by the law. Ray Morby, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Michael Schofield. And thank you, Maureen Duffy. That's all tonight from Late Night Lineup. Until tomorrow night, good night. <laughs> The end of lineup means the end of BBC Two's transmissions for today as well. So.